let's try that again because it's Friday night. Hello, everyone. Woo! Sounds better. Yeah. Thank you for joining us this evening. We're very, very happy to have you here at the Natural History Museum. My name is Marisol Jara. I'm the manager of public programs. And welcome to First Fridays. So this 2022, yes, definitely, please. <laughs> This 2022 First Friday season, from seeds to psychedelics, um, celebrates the power of plants and how they save us. So we're returning to the roots of well-being with new ideas drawn from ancient ways. Each month, join us for dynamic discussions designed to be thought-provoking and inspiring. We'd like to acknowledge our media partner, KCRW, and our event partner, I Am Sound. We're also excited to share that for this month, um, our partners at LA 2050 have opened up public voting in this year's LA 2050 Grants Challenge. This year, LA 2050 is asking you about what local issues you care about most to determine how one million in grants will be awarded. Make your voice heard by voting online today. Today is actually the last day to vote and visit our table in the Otis Booth Pavilion downstairs outside by the gardens to cast your vote and also to just share with everyone here what are the issues that matter most to you. So we invite you to do that after this discussion. Uh, so without any further ado, talking about a discussion, it's my pleasure to introduce you to our moderator this evening, not just for tonight, but for the entire season. Uh, please welcome neuroscientist and science communicator, Dr. Yuande Pierce. Take it away. Thank you, Marisol, for the warm introduction, as always. And welcome back to First Fridays. I can't believe that it's May already, so if this is your third time, welcome. And if this is your first time, then I hope that you'll keep coming back for the rest of the season. So tonight is actually a hot topic. We are talking about plant-based items, which I'm sure you'll agree are everywhere. But is moving towards a plant-based lifestyle possible? What are alternative meats and how can they impact the food market in the future? So we're going to be discussing how a shift in our food system can actually be better for us, but also for the environment. So I'm excited to get into our discussion. Our guests this evening are Jocelyn Ramirez, plant-based chef, published cookbook author, and advocate for healthy food access in her community. Jocelyn is the founder of Todo Verde, one of LA's acclaimed plant-based Mexican food um, businesses, and Ricardo Submartin, Professor of Biotechnology and Plant-Based Foods. Ricardo is Director of UC Berkeley's Alt Meat Lab, a unique educational hub where students learn food science and entrepreneurial principles to develop the next generation of plant-based foods. Welcome, Justin and Ricardo. I'm very excited for our conversation. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. Thank you so much. Thank yeah. you. Okay, so I thought we could start the discussion this evening by thinking about definitions of what plant-based actually means. Um, so in exploring the concept of plant-based foods, it seems to me that plants offer two broad opportunities. So first is to serve as a building block that allows us to mimic the taste and sensory experience of eating meat or other things like milk or by seducing us away from meat by making us rethink and celebrate plants for what they actually are. So what are the implications of approaching food from these two different perspectives? So Jocelyn, perhaps you'd like to start? Yeah, I mean, I think that someone like myself coming from a Latinx community uh, who predominantly ate a lot of meat growing up, both at fast food chains because I lived in a low income area to also um, eating all the carne asadas and all of those things. It's definitely been a journey to get to the point where I am plant-based myself as well as trying to educate folks on what that journey could look like for them. And so just thinking about like the building blocks of it is definitely trying to find a way where you meet someone where they are, mm -hmm. what they're currently eating, um, and trying to figure out how can we uh, transform plants to create something that still feels nostalgic, that still feels very much in line with cultural cuisines that people have grown up eating. 
Absolutely, and I think that's the popularity of Tolo Verde, which we'll go more into as we continue this discussion, but I do think when you frame it as plant-based and you think of vegetables, if you have a very limited view, then how do you kind of get beyond that? But on a very like molecular basis as well, Ricardo, I wondered what your thoughts are on actually the fact that plants and meats serve different purposes, like their protein serves different purposes, and how that translation happens. Well, um, maybe contrary to what you're expecting to say, uh, plants are very different from meat. So to get from a plant protein, which has a definite structure, and um, get to a mimic meat, you need to do a lot of processing. So, I mean, I work at UC Berkeley, and we are probably the, one of the few independent uh, places where we both love plant-based, but at the same time, we are not full advocates. And, uh, and why I say that is because when you go from the molecular constituents of a plant and you want to mimic that and make it a meat, you have to isolate. So if the plant has fibers, vitamins, minerals, those are gone and you just have protein, and they're called protein isolates. With those protein isolates, that's about the few building blocks that you can tweak around mm -hmm. and make the thing look like a meat, right? But proteins in plants serve such a different purpose than in animals that you are really facing a very processed food. And then I guess it still is plant, I mean, it's a plant-based alternative that when you reduce it to the molecular basis, you often lose sight of what you're losing. So I think that's a really important point that you bring up and actually leads to a, another question about language. So I think in a very crude way, you can talk about imitation meat, which is exactly what it is, but then you go to a restaurant and you see things on the menu like tempeh, smoky bacon, which is a lot more seductive. Um, so language is really important and a key factor, I think, in effectively marketing plant-based foods to consumers, but I wondered if you could expand a little bit about what language means to you and the importance of terminology in your practice with food. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that there's a couple things that came up when we were having conversations prior to this panel. One of them being just really talking about the, the ways in which we describe plant-based food. And some people will use terms like vegan, plant-based, uh, meat alternatives, so on and so forth. There's so many ways to describe it. And so, you know, one of the things that we broke down a little bit more was just looking at the fact that vegan as a a term is actually a th theoretical framework that some people use to live their lives or approach life generally, which means as someone who is vegan chooses not to use animal products in the foods that they eat, in the clothes that they wear, and their, you know, any products in their household, products that you put topically on your body. Um, so someone who is vegan really encompasses that as like a theoretical approach uh, in their life. and. Most people who are vegan, I mean all people who are vegan, will eat a plant-based diet. So just to kind of separate that terminology because it's, it's used very interchangeably. Um, and so for me, I've definitely noticed that, especially for a Latinx community, communities of color, using a trigger word like vegan could be uh, a little bit tough to navigate. People will feel like, oh, you're trying to take all these things away from me, things that I grew up eating and I don't want that, or it's not me, it's not my life. Mm -hmm. And so approaching it a little bit differently and using plant-based as, as, as a diet um, and, and using that terminology has definitely helped so that it feels like people um, are taking a step in a direction that seems a little bit more approachable rather than um, making a completely different lifestyle shift. And in addition to that, when I first started Todo Verde, we were at where were we? We were at MOLA, actually, so another museum. Imagine we're in here, we're cooking up food. We were inside of the museum for whatever reason, which is kind of strange to be like cooking food inside, <laughs> but whatever, we were inside, and folks are coming over and they're like, oh, it smells so good. What, what are you serving? What, what's on the menu? And the person that was um, cashiering for me or you know, selling for me, she was like, oh, it's all vegan. It's all vegan Mexican food. And everybody was like, ugh. I, 
just take it a step back. Oh no, like I, sorry, I don't want it. Even though they, they were lured by the scent of the food. Um, and so from that moment forward, I trained all my staff to just say what it is. This is mushrooms with mole. This is jackfruit tinga. This is heart of palm ceviche. Uh, and not use those trigger words that I feel can really um, have people take a step back from, from this food. Yeah, absolutely. It's, it's so powerful. I think you raise a really important point, which is there is a cultural barrier, definitely, in your perception. Yeah. The first thing you have is language, and so if the language is triggering, then it, it prevents you from exploring an alternative. Naturally, from language, I think, is taste, which is another challenge, I think, in overcoming mm -hmm. sort of that switch from meat. I'm a meat eater. I'm not vegan myself so you know the taste I think is a really key factor and I think will ultimately determine people's preference for plant-based and moving away from meat and other alternatives mm -hmm. so I wonder if we could talk a little bit now about I know you've talked about this a bit the goals of opening your restaurant and having that authentic Mexican flavor but on a very basic level in the lab Ricardo so I think it's inc equally interesting to think about how you can form these flavors in the lab. Like, what is that challenge? Mm. <laughs> Super challenging. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's all I'm going to say. But I don't know if the other day, um, first of all, I am the non vegan director of the vegan program at UC Berkeley. <laughs> yeah. so whatever Disclaimer. you're thinking, <laughs> right? And I have two vegan kids in which defines himself, and that's why language, but what he doesn't eat more than what he eats. It's his self, it's what he thinks he is as a person. And I see that in our students too, but our class in Berkeley, I would say only 10% of the students are vegans. Only 10%. Only 10%. The others are there for the challenge of sustainability or animal cruelty in general, you know, but they're not there as vegans. So it's not the vegan class of UC Berkeley. But having said that, you asked me about the taste. Mm. So the other day I stopped in fast foods, uh, McDonald's. And I said to myself, I'm going to try, what's the name, Mac Burger, no, plant, Mac Plant. Oh, the McPlant, the new McPlant, right. Yeah, okay, <laughs> okay, because I know exactly how they do it. So, so I'm going to try it because they said, you know, if it's in the bun with the cheese, it's not vegan that because it has cheese, okay? So yeah. you go there, I start biting it, and the very first thing that comes to me is the flavor of peas. They're pea-based. Very strong pea-based. It's like the Beyond Burger. Is it bad to say words of companies? I don't think uh, so. I well, think whatever, but, you I know, think everybody, everybody signed an NDA. Okay, yeah. okay, but Coming in. The, that burger, okay, that it smelled everything like peas. So then, since that flavor to take it out isolated and then try to formulate something that tastes like meat mm -hmm. is extraordinarily difficult because that taste is molecularly ingrained mm -hmm. in that protein component of peas. Now, another approach is what Impossible Burger does. They put the precursors of flavor and when you cook, you get those flavors evolve and in that sense I would say it tastes a little bit more like meat, okay? But flavor, either masking flavors that are in plants or trying to, you know, remove the flavor before you get there is a challenge. And I just want to add one more thing. That takes you, if you want to improve that, you go to GMOs. So you can knock the gene of the flavor that's not, um, that's there that you don't want. So if you want better flavors, you're probably going to eat genetically modified um, plants. Thanks, Ricardo. I think that the, I, don't know. I mean I don't know if that's good news or not. Yeah. yeah. Well, I was going to say because GMOs, I think, is such a loaded term and idea, and it has yeah. this history. It's kind of there's a lot of stigma to do with GMOs, and to your point, language is important. Mm -hmm. So just to re just to repeat what you've said, so you have to either knock out the plant flavor, or you have to add something on top of the plant flavor. Either way, processing, or you've got the option of GMOs and GMOs allows you to have a little bit more freedom. Um, and so can we stay on that point a little bit and what some of the 
implications of that are? Is this actually a positive thing or That's just a true. technical thing? In implications in what regard? In terms of, so creating these flavors um, yeah. and sort of whether this then ties into sustainability, is there more to that than mm. just flavor? Yeah, well, I, I, I cannot, a little bit more only on, on like the flavor, whenever you do any study on plant-based products, like imitation products, mm -hmm. flavor comes top of the line to what people, you know, if it tastes good, maybe I'll eat it. And yeah. it's not necessarily you're going to eat it, but probably but if it doesn't taste good, you're not going to eat it, right? So you're going to give the product just one chance. So flavor today, they have not, all these companies with all the research, they have not really, they're not there yet. Mm -hmm. It's very hard. That's why I mentioned the GMO mm -hmm. part, because there's so much you can do with what a plant is. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if that answers your question or you wanted to... No, I think, I think it yeah. does. I think if that barrier is taste yeah. and GMOs give you the option to overcome that barrier and ultimately a lot of the students at your lab are focused on sustainability, yeah. but, then but, yeah. perhaps that's but a But let link. me add one more thing. For some, some of those flavors there are to deter insects, mm -hmm. right? Interesting. So you get the flavor out, then you have to add more pesticide. See, so I, I geek Sorry out listening. <laughs> I really geek out listening to yeah. Ricardo and like getting a more background understanding because I see the products, right? Like recently I went to Expo West, which is a huge uh, national expo. Um, this one was for natural products. It was in Anaheim, maybe a whole week long. And you're going and you're trying small samples of all these new innovative products. And it's like, here's tuna. Here's, you know, all, and, and some of them were really delicious, you know, or as close to, the real thing as you could get. Some of them were terrible. I was like, why, why did you spend thousands of dollars to be here, give me this, and it tastes so terrible, there's no way I'll ever wanna try that again. So it's true, you only have that one shot, but some people are really compromising flavor. It's like the uh, form before function, function before form, um, and it almost seems like it's really hard for people to find the perfect balance of the two yes. for processed foods. Absolutely, and actually we were having a conversation before this discussion, and you mentioned the egg, like you can actually have something that looks like a boiled egg, which is yeah. more of a texture thing. So right. really thinking about what the possibilities are within biotechnology, but then also what really goes into it, and then those decisions mm -hmm. that are made culturally about whether you would adopt that, or whether you'd uh, want to have that or not, I think is right. interesting. I, I think the word culture here mm -hmm. is a key question, because Many of the arguments of people that run these companies about saying that rapid adoption, they compare it with the cell phone. And that's totally wrong. Because they say, I mean, look, in 10 years, everyone has a cell phone now. But that's, to that's totally different than having food. Mm -hmm. Food is culturally ingrained, is part of what makes us humans. It's a reunion. It's, it's so many things that a phone is not. Right? So, people having options, I think is great. And our classes are to make more options. But we are not claiming that everyone should turn and start replacing things that, you know, are animal-based by plant-based. Or parts of the plant-based. I think yeah. that's a, thank you for bringing that up, because that's yeah. a, a good um, transition to the next part of the discussion, which is to really think about the argument for adopting more plant-based alternatives, not just meats, but dairy products and things like that. Um, it seems to me that it's health versus sustainability. So there are these two strong arguments. So there's a health-related one, and then there's an environmental one. So let's maybe just get into some of the key points to that argument, and I know we've touched on a few things already. Um, and whether these arguments are compelling enough to convince people to move more towards the plant-based lifestyle, but also with the caveat, should we be moving towards a plant-based lifestyle? Mm -hmm. Is that actually the, the key question? I mean, changing any one of us is super hard. <laughs> so <Yeah. laughs> now I, I teach students, I work with students that are like 17-year-old, 18-year-old. They don't have that burden on top of them. So for them, they're very open to new things. Mm -hmm. You know, and they create, you know, like what I was telling you, hard-boiled eggs made from plants and things like that. 
But for someone that already has some tradition in food, then information is not, I mean, it's like <laughs> no one is going to change you because it tells you it's bad. I mean, we, we all know it may be bad, but it's not going to change. I personally have adopted oats. I'm a fan of oats, but because of health issues too. So I eat oats like crazy. <laughs> I eat oats all day, right? But, and has lowered the cholesterol. That really works, okay? So, but the thing is, for health reasons, more than, than, than I have a conviction that it will help the planet, it's so abstract to some people mm -hmm. yeah. that it's very hard with that information to change a behavior. It's so emotional food. So it, it, it's not going to happen. Yeah. yeah. Do you agree I'm, with that, Justin? I absolutely agree. I mean, it's, I feel like with my work, when I first started, I was definitely on that mission of like, I really want to try to encourage more people to go plant-based as much as possible, um, you know, starting with my own family. And I've gotten to the point now where it's like, well, if I can encourage people to kind of take a 50-50 approach, that's, that's a step in a great direction. It doesn't need to be 100%. My parents are not 100% plant-based. Um, and so, you know, it's, it's again, finding that middle ground of what works and what I have also found in just uh, food demonstrations and conversations that I've had with community members is that health is really more of the defining factor of what will have somebody shift. And it's, it's kind of sad because it's a little bit of a, a Hail Mary or an afterthought. Hey, my dad got cancer. Or I have mm -hmm. cancer. Or I, I just got pre diagnosed pre-diabetic. I want to go plant-based now. I want to change so that I, you know, you were talking about the oats that lowered the cholesterol, yeah. right? Um, and so a lot of folks will not adopt it as a regular lifestyle approach. They'll get to a point where it's like, I have to change. If not, I'm going to, my body will deteriorate much faster than it should. Um, and so I try to bring that narrative into conversations that I have. And then in terms of sustainability, I mean, that's huge for me personally. Um, and I think it's something that I've always been really passionate about since I was a kid, it, it not really understanding the full framework of it, but, but still really thinking that it's an important approach to our life. And, and it's interesting because you're, you know, you're saying that it's hard for people to adopt a different lifestyle because they, they maybe don't see themselves as a part of the puzzle. Mm -hmm. And we kind of separate ourselves as though, you know, our bodies are separate than the ecosystem in which we live in, yeah, which definitely. is so untrue. And, and it's a matter of us really placing ourselves in this holistic way within the world and each other. I mean, we all lived through COVID we all got each other sick. We're yeah. so interconnected with each other. And then we saw how that, that shifted so much within the environment as well. Um, and so if that, that can make a shift, I don't know. I don't know yeah, what's I mean, wrong it, with humanity. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it, it is also interconnected. And I think we do have, for whatever reason, a tendency to separate. Actually, I was reading something really interesting, a study which you probably know about this, Ricardo, but in terms of how plant-based foods are changing the market, it's growing, mm -hmm. but it hasn't actually dented like, the meat market, for example, at all. And people don't tend to buy plant-based meat alternatives to replace beef. It would replace chicken or fish, which is really surprising to me. So it does sound like this 50-50 thing that you're saying, which is... Do half, do a little bit of both is what people are doing. Um, I know at the Alt Meat Lab, you have a really holistic approach to um, the plant-based. Um, Sorry, what? At the at UC Ber at yeah. Berkeley, at the Meat Lab, I, I know you've described your approach as holistic. Could you talk a little bit about that, just of well, what Justin I mean, was saying? We, we have the freedom, contrary mm -hmm. to a company narrative, to explore more difficult questions. Mm -hmm. So if you want to replace, like, this object meet with this object, I think, you know, it's, I can, you know, say it tastes like peas or whatever, but it's something that can be done. Mm -hmm. Now, if you look at the label and you look at the health implications of that, is we're not even there yet. I mean, it has enough saturated fats there, like yeah. meat, it mm. has more sodium. Now you think they're silly and they do that because they're silly. No, because they need it for the hint the thing to hold, you know, yeah. if not, it doesn't hold. Mm -hmm. So, so that, that in itself means that 
when we ask our students, we ask them, say, hey, look, we're going to work in plant-based, but we're going to work in plant-based that are healthy, that they're delicious, hopefully, that they are affordable. This cannot be an elite mm -hmm. thing. It has to touch everyone. And it has to be there for, and, and maybe the answer is, it will never be for everyone. But you cannot fiddle that, you mm -hmm. know, because it's more expensive, whatever. Then it has to be based on local raw materials. Today, any of these burgers get their oil from the other part of the world, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And those cheese, the vegan cheese, they're macadamia nuts, or how do you call it? Cashew. Cashew nuts, those ones, okay. <laughs> cashew nuts, they're ground cashew nuts, with some acidity. That's not a cheese, but that's, that's a spreadable, okay? Mm -hmm. But that's what it is. So the carbon footprint of He's that calling me out. is extremely <laughs> Oh, high. no, it's a collapse. <laughs> <laughs> no, keep going. Justin, oh, okay, sorry about that. Okay. That one is very good. But, 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 but what I'm saying is, when you ask the students a harder question, that you have to comply with all these criteria, then, it becomes a much, I mean, very difficult to innovate in the space. And our students crack their heads. And some of them succeed, but it's not like mainstream. It's, there are not zillions of solutions there. Mm -hmm. It's much more limited. Got so it. you need to know a lot of chemistry, and you need to know a lot of old plants, and you need to know a lot of science. Because if not, you're not going to make it. It's not easy. It's not easy. Mm -hmm. I mean, describing the way that you broke that down, it really does make you think how much of a challenge it is to overcome and then the scalability like how do you make this global if the question is are we yeah. moving towards plant-based then are we is I think is the question um yeah I, actually I, my next question was going to be more to you Jocelyn because at the moment there are supply chain issues mm -hmm. inflation the cost of ingredients all of these things are really challenging I think the food market in general and I'm wondering if your feeling is that this is impacting more plant-based side of things, or could be impacting the meat side and driving people more towards plant-based? How do you see this yeah, kind I of mean, going? I think just from being in conversation with other friends who are chefs throughout the city of LA who cook meat and you know serve meat and then also are plant-based, it seems to be something that's affecting everyone, mm -hmm. uh, not just specifically either or. Uh, and so, it, it's it's been a huge issue. Supply issues have been a big factor in raising prices, and a lot of people may already see plant-based food or restaurants at a higher price point that is only going up because it, it's and it's not just about the food itself, the the raw ingredients. It's also staffing. So you know you may have somebody in the past that I would have hired at you know, $20 an hour that's now asking for 25 or 27. Uh, and so you want to honor what people need uh, to feel like they're in a good working environment. But that's a whole other, that's a whole other yeah. story. Um, but the, all those things kind of trickle down to the consumer. Um, and over the pandemic, I've been, you know, doing a lot of online cooking classes and I published my cookbook and I've been really trying to put that power into the hands of the consumers, the folks who are usually going to restaurants because people were cooking at home more than ever. And I know we're out and about a lot more and eating out a lot more again, um, but knowing that people can kind of empower themselves to prepare things on a more consistent basis at home mm -hmm. is what I was trying to do because I feel like, I don't know if if restaurant restaurants have never been sustainable. Just FYI, I don't know why I chose this industry. Um, they have never been. People don't go into restaurants to make a ton of money. That's why you have franchises because you make a little bit of money off of all the different um, locations that you have. And so, this has just really amplified that tenfold, and it makes me feel like we're supposed to be cooking more of our own food. If we have the, the means and the, and the land, we should be growing more of our own food um, and connecting to food on a deeper level than just going to a restaurant and expecting it to be delicious and cheap. And uh, it, that's a luxury 
frankly, and people see it as just like an everyday commodity, like it's just, oh, I'm going to a restaurant to get my food. It's such a luxury that we just oversee. Yeah, that's or there's oversight. I don't know what the no, right word I, is, but. I, I mean, I think that's a really good point, and I know that you do your, like, you, was it a, a podcast about your recommended pantry ingredients, like plant-based ingredients that you would recommend? as part of that. Yeah, it was, a, it was with Tastemade, and I That's did a, it. like they had a live class that I did, and it's on YouTube now. So I'm pretty much, I just opened up my pantry, and I'm like, these are things I like to use as meat alternatives. These are things I like to use to flavor, to create umami flavors. These are things for blah, blah, blah. And I just went through my whole refrigerator and pantry. Do you, would you share a few of those items, maybe? <laughs> I mean, you also have a cookbook, and you contribute to the New York Times, so without giving away too many, Secrets. So there are a couple yeah. of items that you feel like are yeah. a good place to start. I mean, I think that there are a, f uh, a lot of plant-based ingredients and seasonings that we can use that create umami flavor. I really love mushrooms, dried mushrooms. I'll, I'll grind dried mushrooms into a powder and add them to a ton of things. Um, nutritional yeast. There is... Um, liquid aminos or soy sauce, tamari, black garlic, um, all these things will help, tomato paste even, you know, all these things will help amplify flavors so that you taste whatever the thing may be. Like it could even be like a, like a soup with beans and veggies, but you taste it and there's like all these other notes and there's just enough of it to make your palate excited about what's happening, but not enough where it's overpowering the dish. So those are some things I think everybody should have in their pantry. Lots of dried chiles, chile powders. All of I have it. the nutritional yeast tick, definitely. It does actually make a, a, a difference to the flavor, I've noticed. It does. It's pretty good. Um, Ricardo, I'll come back to you as well. So um, we talked about mushrooms, and I think we're really trying to think about here sustainability, because it's, it's the interconnectedness. So we've talked about what you what happens in the lab. How about mushrooms? Because I know that there is this whole different route that you can right. take. Yeah. Um, so I've been talking a little bit more like the challenges that plant-based has. And you were talking before about sustainability comes with a very close supply chain mm -hmm. and secure supply chain. So I was saying before, you know, that the fat, the coconut fat comes from the other part of the world in a ship and it's used for the burgers. And it has to be based on local ingredients. So, having said that, I love mushrooms. And my daughter, my small daughter, she's there, she's sitting here, okay? <laughs> uh, uh, she introduced me to the world of like mushrooms. But before that, I, I've been trained as a fermentation scientist. So, there's a lot of talk about now producing things with fermenters. The only one that has proven at scale and that has a lot of potential are what's called filamentous fungi. Those, I mean, in England, there's a company called Corn has been there oh, yeah. for ages yeah. doing that, okay? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Corn, turkey, right? Tur yeah. the turkey. And, and those, because, because this is the thing, fungi has already that structure mm -hmm. that is, resembles a muscle. So you don't have to take like the soy protein isolate, which doesn't have any structure, and put it in a machine called extruder to look like a muscle. It already has that. It has a protein content. It's bland in, fla in flavor. Mm -hmm. So you will see more and more companies coming out doing this at scale. And it's scalable. You can do it in huge fermenters at, at the cost. So those kind of solutions, I think, can be implemented locally in mm -hmm. mm -hmm. helping the sustainability. But sustainability is such a big word, you know, like, you, you, I mean, if you want to be really sustainable, rice and beans, if you happen to, you know, have beans <laughs> around. Some people that work in this field and they're not vegans and they don't have uh, much consideration with animals, they say you want to be, you know, really sustainable, beans and rice and chicken. Chicken is, with the meats, is the most sustainable one. I'm not saying that I, I advocate that, okay? <laughs> but what I'm saying is it has so, that, that industry has perfected so much and optimized so much that in terms of like pound of beef, that's the most sustainable one. Which is, doesn't mean it's super sustainable, but it's, it's sustainable. I mean, 
I mean, the carbon footprint is, is orders of magnitude like red meat. That's a really interesting point that you, you like, brought up there because as we've been speaking, it feels like we can't really fit it all under the same umbrella. And if it comes down to an individual decision, if the, I guess if the first barrier is taste and then there's sustainability and then there's health, then I don't know if they all really fit together in that connected way. And so when you're making a decision, maybe you'll be making a decision more towards health, maybe you'll be making a decision towards sustainability, but they'll be very different things. And I guess they need different developments. Mm -hmm. Like you talked about mushrooms, that's more to do with sustainability. But then also flavor, I think, because you were mentioning that this is something that you would suggest using. Mm -hmm. um, so thank you for kind of bringing that up. Um, I then also wanted to talk a little bit more about I know, Justin, you have a podcast, which is Beyond the Recipe, which features different people within the plant-based space. And I know that we talked a bit about the holistic approach that the Alt Meat Lab takes. So this conversation is about food and meat alternatives, but it feels like a much bigger conversation. So we've touched on sustainability, the environment, but there's also politics and social issues. So I wonder where the discussion is going in general, if it's not just to completely move towards plant-based, where else do we need to be sort of thinking about the relevance of plant-based foods alternatives, do you think? I can go, you can go, whatever. You can go ahead, yeah. Well, I'm perfect. like, I, I can just <laughs> listen no, to I Ricardo. Think, I mean, why I am doing what I do, yeah. basically, that's what I, first, I mean, there's so many reasons, but one, the first one, when they offer me to, to start this program, it was like, oh, that's great, because I'll understand also the world of my kids, and I will understand the world of my small daughter, where she's going to work, and if I can do something about that, and the students, you know, are so passionate about that, that perfect. But for me, the broader question is like, will this help us to have a different way of being in the world? Mm. Because it's not just the object food, but if I go and there and eat the mac plant, and I drive in a huge truck, mm -hmm. and I throw away all the plastic everywhere, yeah. and, I mean, I mean, the, the, finally the thing has a little bit, I mean, doesn't have animal there. Yeah. Doesn't help anything. It's not another way of being in the world. So my broader question, I mean, the reason I'm there is how can this could be part of us seeing animals differently, not as just resources, plants, everything. Because when you think about plants, these are monocultures. I mean, don't think it's like a nice prairie, you know what I mean? Okay, <laughs> <awesome>. <laughs> I mean? Put a fertilizer and some, you know, unwanted side effects like killing all the insects which, with spray. Right? Mm -hmm. So so it's uncontaminating yeah. rivers and whatever, right? So it's another way of being in the world. If this is something that can contribute to that, for me that's the broader question where this plant based fits in. Mm -hmm. That's a very personal answer. Yeah. Thanks, yeah. Ricardo. Yeah. Yeah, I think, I think for me, what, I'll, I'll share that I originally went plant-based because I attended an indigenous veganism workshop led by uh, someone who's now my mentor, Claudia Serato, and, um, and her, her approach to food is all around decolonial framework. So really thinking about how do we take a step back and look at ourselves from an indigenous perspective of how we approach the land, the food, consumption. And so I really love what you're talking about, Ricardo, in that you can eat more mushrooms, but if they're all covered in plastic and there's so much packaging and you're creating so much trash, um, then is it, is it really better? I mean, I'm pretty sure we can break down the numbers and science and see maybe it is or isn't, you know, as compared to beef, for example. But I, I'm, I'm really inspired by Claudia's work and the work of a lot of other indigenous chefs throughout the nation who are, um, in a sense, kind of reviving um, the, not just the, um, the exciting elements about food, but like the resurgence of the knowledge and information um, and, and using that as an approach to talk to people about like, are we taking all these other things into consideration when we choose a, a plant-based lifestyle or a vegan lifestyle. And the fact that indigenous communities were not 100% vegan or plant-based, like they did consume animals, but for special occasions around ceremony, um, there was a sense of gratitude for this animal and this being giving their life for you in turn to live yours. And we just don't do that. We're so far removed from that. So it's having those conversations to try to figure out like where do we go from here? in a way that makes sense for 
everyone and everything around us. Absolutely, and I think, as you, to your point about there's the fact that you don't necessarily have to not eat meat, it's also about our practices and what agricultural practices look like mm -hmm. that is the issue. So rather than necessarily separating plant-based from everything else, it all actually really ties together. Um, Ricardo, do you have anything, I don't know, we've, spoke, we've been speaking about meat, but there are, are other ways that you can ap um, apply plant-based protein. So I know that you have another company where you do work, which is yeah. completely different. Can we talk a little bit about that? Because it really does go beyond right. food. Well, our lab got the name Alt Meat mm -hmm. because at the beginning meat was a thing, but we do cheese and you know they, all, all other sort of things. So, but as I said before, there's so much you can do with plants that you know there are categories that are totally open, like yogurt, mm -hmm. I mean, mm -hmm. and even even you know eggs. I mean, there's only one brand there, and um, some categories are easier. For example, when people say plant-based are increasing a lot mm -hmm. in the market, basically that's driven for the plant-based milk. Yeah, mm. it's not the milk. Okay. If you mix oil and water, it would look with the stirrer, it's white. And that's what it is, okay? okay? That's very little protein. So these are extracts from almond or you know oats or whatever, but they're not milk in the sense of the nutritional content of milk. And you can argue if we need it or we don't need it, but that's another story. But what I'm saying, those, you don't drink like a whole oat milk on its own or something but you mix it with other things. That's why that is easier and it's not structured like a meat. Mm -hmm. So that one is an easier category. You know, liquids are not structured. That's why ground beef is much more easier than making, you know, steak. Mm -hmm. And how about fish? I mean, that's not gonna, that's that not gonna like happen. That's the biggest okay? Because I mean, every fish is different either. So <laughs> all the structure, you take a salmon, you know, all the structure and people say, oh, 3D printing. I mean, the techno optimists can go anywhere. You know, anywhere. I mean, yeah. to print the steak, it takes you ages. Oh, yeah. Ages. I mean, like, it, like you buy a 3D print and try to print the steak. I mean, like, it's not scalable. <laughs> it's not scalable. So, yeah. but there's this whole thing. The thing is, let me say something. Both of these companies <laughs> are backed by VCs that made their money in tech. Yeah. So they treat this as tech. So they put a bunch of money expecting to get mm, zillions in return. Right? How you, you convince those VCs? By telling them exactly what they want to hear. Mm -hmm. They're going to conquer the world with this and technology is the solution. And with food, technology may not be the solution. And you can go and borrow foods from other cultures that have been using plant-based for years, yeah, you know yeah, I mean? Yeah, for definitely. not years, centuries, you know? And rediscover hummus, for example, you know? Things that don't resemble something else. Our students reject the idea of resembling immediately, mm -hmm. you know, after like three weeks. Why we have to make this thing look like this thing if it's not? So, okay, I got carried away. Sorry no, about I that. No, I think that's a beautiful no, no. point to, to yeah. stop sorry. because sorry, that... Sorry, everyone. Yeah. Because that ties in so well, I think, with your, your response, Justin, to the previous question. And I think that that's a really great place to end the conversation. We actually would love to hear questions from the audience. So there are some volunteers, from Natural History Museum volunteers who'll come around with a microphone and you can raise your hand and they'll come and find you. Lots of questions, I love it. Yeah, always lots of questions. I love it. <laughs> We're gonna be here all night. It's a good question. <laughs> it's all 3 a.m. We're still answering um, questions. Oh, here, over here on the left. Hi, I know that GMOs are very often thought of like, you want to be cautious and avoid them because maybe they can be bad. Is it possible to make a GMO something that would make it easier to digest food or make it better and more healthy for you? What was the question? Is it possible to make a GMO that would make it um, healthy, like it could, you could digest it better and it would be healthier for you? So is there a positive application of a GMO? I think well, that was the question. I mean, Impossible Burger has a GMO in its formulation. So, is, if that goes in that direction, the question is like, GMOs could improve taste, could improve some traits of the plants that are not there, and therefore expand what things can be done with plants and whatnot. It will be processed 
and it will be GMO. Could it help with digestion, for example? Can you apply GMOs oh, in that way? I mean, there's so little experience eating this protein isolates or whatever in, you know, in great quantities that there's no data whatsoever about the health implication in the microbiota, for example, in the, in the gut. Oh, interesting. People are saying, well, they're based on plants, so they should be okay, right? But there's yeah. no data whatsoever on that. It could be allergenic, it could be cause other problems because yeah. our microbes in the gut are not used to that, right? So it's a hope that it's not going to harm us, but maybe in 10 years we find that mm -hmm. It's, the solution was even worse than the yeah. problem. And that's a real concern for me, too, because as somebody who's really trying to encourage people to go more plant-based, you don't know if them eating, really leaning on processed foods, like Impossible, that it has so much saturated fat in it, that later down the line they're going to still have heart disease and all the things that we were, I was trying to prevent, and they're going to say, see, plant-based wasn't actually the answer. Uh, and, and that is a real concern because I, I'm trying to encourage people to use whole ingredients and season them really nicely and, and, and eat that. But so a really only good time point. will tell. Next question, I think we have someone over here on the right. Uh, do you guys think that it would make it easier to attract more people to plant-based foods and to maybe mess around with plants to make them resemble meats for people that are more into the taste and feel of meat, if we started playing around with and growing a wider variety of foods, a wider variety of plants, and not just sticking to the Western traditional crops or the crops that have been grown in large scale in Asia, but maybe looking around um, what indigenous peoples have done and smaller communities and peoples. Mm, yeah, yeah, I think so. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, well, yeah. I, I wasn't sure if you were asking what the question um, But yeah, I definitely think that people can, I mean, you can go outside and get like dandelion greens or um, I, like I just had a, a stinging nettle pesto uh, on wild rice that a friend of mine made for me. Um, you know, so you can really use what is on the, you know, in our local landscape to produce really delicious flavor profiles. And, you know, I, I launched a line of seasoning last year, late last year, because I want to encourage people to say, hey, I am going to use um, mushrooms that I'm foraging locally, and I'm going to season them with this carnita style seasoning to try to amplify that flavor even more. You know, I, I mean, your approach is exactly what we're trying to explore, yeah. to bring the cultural richness of the world, because it's absent. This is very western center. Mm -hmm. in especially where I work, mm -hmm. Silicon Valley Center, <laughs> the, yeah. Bay, the Bay Area Center, you know, I mean, and people, you know, cheer each, each other up, but you go to Sacramento, yeah. and they don't know what you're talking about. You know, I mean, <laughs> like, like, I mean, like, but in San Francisco, everyone gets super excited with these yeah. things. So I think it's, it needs to open, and we need to, you know, get scouters and and work with the people, not just go and borrow something. Be there with the people, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. and learn from them mm -hmm. in a very humble way, you know, yeah. Great answers. Uh, there's a question at the back here, on the left. Uh, yes, so uh, earlier you talked about the processing involved with making plant-based things equal to protein of meat. Um, with that processing, is it just extra steps or is it like actual processing? in terms of like carbon footprint, how much pollution or byproduct would that create? In that sense, is it actually helpful or is it worse? Yeah, that's for me, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. No, it's, <laughs> that's for you. I mean, you have to think that most of the plant proteins are just, they're found in grains and they're what's called storage proteins. So they're globular, right? Whereas our muscles, you know, allow us to move around and they're, they're fibrous. So to go from a globular protein to a fibrous structure, structure, you need to put it in a very intense machine called an extruder, which shears, creates a lot of shear. And so the carbon footprint of that is, is, I mean, it's high. So it's very debatable. The, you would think that sustainable-wise, it will be very, 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 very um, much more sustainable. 
The thing is, there are many of the documents out there are what scientists like me call white papers. They're made by the companies and they're not in what's called peer review journals. So no one reviewed anything and they put it there. And those are the ones that again and again journalists quote and quote and quote saying this is great, it doesn't use water, it doesn't use energy, I mean this is fantastic. <laughs> it's not true. I mean independent studies are urgently needed in this space. Yeah. On the right, I think there's a question here. Thanks. Um, I'd like to know about the role of government in this. So subsidies, grants, policies, um, how does that affect your industries and what would you like to see? Yeah. Good we talked question. about this briefly um, as we were discussing be before this panel. Um, you know, the animal agriculture industry is heavily subsidized by the government. So when you see the price of, or when someone perceives plant-based ingredients to be at a higher price point that are inaccessible, it's actually a false perception of those price points because of the subsidies that create a low cost point for things like chicken and beef. Um, and so, yeah, it, it, it definitely makes it difficult for somebody to say, hey, this burger is, you know, a, I could get it for $1.99, but if I want to eat a plant-based version of that, or even mushrooms, you know, m some mushrooms are fairly expensive if you want to get a really, um, a mushroom that has developed more flavors in it. So yeah, it's, it's definitely a false narrative in my opinion. Mm. Yeah. 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 I can You're say like something up? on that. Yeah, um, yeah. Avocado, I yeah. think, you know, well, the thing is, the meat subsidized, let's say, two dollars or whatever, it really costs four. Yeah. But then the guys in, in the plant-based space, like what I work on, say, okay, so they're subsidized, so it should be four. Because I cannot make it for, for two, I can make it for three. So, which means, basically, you have to go up in all prices. Mm -hmm. Whenever you process, I mean, if you do more like less processed foods with plant-based, you can reach the price target. But not even with soy protein isolate, which is done at scale and whatever, you will never reach the competitive price um, with plant-based ingredients. Mm, They're not going to cost lower. In, let me say, it's a fallacy to say it's economy of scale. Because if 70% of the cost is due to the raw material, the machinery doesn't, doesn't count much. Mm -hmm. okay. yeah. Sobering so, thought. Sorry about that. <laughs> no, it's a good point to On raise. your left. There's another question here. Oh, thank you. Um, with regards to one of your final points about um, sort of printing meats or lab-based, or lab-grown meats, um, assuming the technology was viable, do you think that that would actually even serve the same demographic, since a lot of the argument for plant-based seems to be about health or sustainability, or would that serve a completely different consumer demographic? Hmm. Good uh, question. I, I can speak very harshly on cell-based. Okay, cell-based meat, I mean, it's not the, I know, not the topic. It, ha, it will never be um, economical at scale. And these companies are shifting now, and they are becoming what's called ingredient companies. So they're saying, oh, but n let's produce a little bit of fat cells, because, but they're gonna make it, mix it with like 99% a, a plant-based matrix. So it will never be economical scale. Now, this is, has been published in journals of prestige, but the industry just don't want to hear that, because there's so much money behind that they don't want to hear that, but it will never fly. And I've said that everywhere. And no one comes back with a technique. This is not based on what I think or what I... This is based on numbers and engineering and economics. It's not hopes or anything. So, this is not going to work. So don't worry. <laughs> um, there's a question. This is going to be the last question. You're on the left. Okay, this is the last question, unfortunately. Oh, that was a nice one. Um, <laughs> sorry. Um, can... can Either of you speak about factory farming and just the carbon um, output that factory farming is having, and I think a lot of people 
um, are switching to plant-based because of they're hearing all this information about how detrimental factory farms are? Yeah, that's, that's a great question. I can start off with, uh, with answering that. I mean, I think that we know now, I think that some of the veils have been lifted to a certain extent where we can get a better understanding of not only the mistreatment of animals, but how bad in terms of a carbon footprint, like you're mentioning, that is, especially in the beef industry where <laughs> Um, there's so much consumption, um, there's so much um, use of, of things like hormones, um, there's so much uh, that's going into our water reserves or, you know, just because of how many animals um, that were seen in the land. Like, so we just had all the fires, the Amazon fires a couple of years ago. And, uh, and many people were speculating that that was uh, a plot to just remove some of the natural landscape to make way for more animal agriculture space. And so it's definitely something that we need to uh, think about a lot more critically and, and also consider not just the carbon footprint, but the uh, working conditions for the employees um, of, of these, these spaces, these farms, um, and how terrible they are and the fact that we just can't see unless we can't go there unless there's like secret footage and nobody wants to look at the PETA footage because it's sad. Um, we need to look at it. We need to be up at 3 a.m. scrolling, you know, and wondering what we're doing with our lives. Um, <laughs> Not on TikTok. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, I can just, I mean, I agree with you. The thing is we're so far removed from that reality. Yeah. That is the thing. I mean, like, why my son is vegan and not vegan? Because he senses that. Mm -hmm. He can see the suffering of the animal. I, for reasons, because the way I, I am, I, I don't feel it that close to me, right? But, but for him, it's, it's a crime. And if you see all this, you know, all the footage and everything, you know it's something totally unsustainable. That is, it, it cannot continue. Yeah. I mean, but it is so ingrained for historical reasons, you know, now you can demonize them, but people pushed this industry to become that efficient and to do that. So the narrative has to change. Yeah. So I have big hopes with, you know, younger generations speaking against that. Yeah. And I think that's a really great way to end the conversation. I think Ch this idea of changing the narrative and you've both been such incredible panelists. So thank you so much for joining our discussion this evening. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Amazing. Thank you. Thank you so much. So thank you to the audience and for your amazing questions as always. Um, at 8 p.m. at the main stage in the natural, in the nature, sorry, gardens will be our live musical performances. So please join us down there. And remember that the next First Fridays will be June 3rd and the topic will be seed sovereignty. And if you haven't voted already, don't forget to vote. So thank you very much and have a good rest of the evening. <laughs> thank you.